Let's uh, let's begin with prayer this morning. Once we are all situated, let's pray. Well, God, thank you for another opportunity today to gather around and, and study your word. Today, we're feeling especially thankful for all the mothers you've placed into our lives. Thank you for how you've blessed us through them, how you've shown us a reflection of your love in them. And, and thank you especially for those mothers who shared God's word with us. Uh, as we study that word today, bless us, uh, help us to, to understand better, finding the middle road between loving the world and, and hating it, but, but rather finding contentment. Uh, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're on our last stop along this road that it's been my pleasure to, to navigate with you uh, between two difficult ditches or dangerous ditches and finding the, the narrow road of God's truth in the scripture. For those who weren't here two weeks ago when we started this, and it was two weeks ago, our last stop here, or our last stretch, was between an idolatrous love for the world and an ungrateful intent of the world, in other words, loving the world too much, right? And, and loving all that they did, and the people, possessions that they have, or hating the world. Because it doesn't tell us to do that either. There's a danger in that, because, of course, everything is from God. We hear that in our readings today. Uh, and so we're trying to find the middle road of that. We got to number four on the front page last time. And I think this is a good reminder of where we're at. Kind of, we were discovering the attitudes that we're guarding against when we talk about love for the world. And so I asked a bit of a trick question. I said, what material things did John warn against loving? Let's look at it for a little bit. And then we started to realize, oh, there's not really anything material in here at all. But what it is, is the attitude toward our material things, toward the blessings in our lives. So you see that everything in the world, but then he doesn't list off literal physical things. He says the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. So, you know, this, this desire of our flesh to want um, the pride that we have about the things we might have, that comes not from the Father, but from the world. And ultimately the world, so yeah, the things in this world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Then we ask at the end, what is that will of God or God's will that all men be saved? That they call on him, uh, that they put their faith in Christ. And so we're starting to discover that this is an attitude. Um, when it comes to love for the world, that attitude problem, not a things problem. We're going to look more at that. And one of the big things we, we talked about last time was this idea of means, how we live with, with the things that we have in life. Are we looking at them as our goal and the thing we're living for? In other words, the ends. Or are we seeing them as a means for which God gives us to, to serve him, to, to serve others? And we discussed that a lot and what that looks like in number three. So let's dig into the scripture and see how we can live as though things are a means, a gift to us to be used. Uh, we've got four passages there, and we'll look at the fifth one together. So we'll split into four groups. It's just a couple of passages, so I'll only give you about a minute or two. I'll we'll look it up and see what it teaches us. So we'll have Corinne, you want to join with the boys here? And you guys can look up the first passage there. Um, and I think you can do a little time. Pastor, get them. Actually, now it's a good friend. You want to just go to Pastor and Karen? That'll keep it enough. So we get to the Pastor. Now we get the first thing to be 5 8. And then we've got 1 John 3 17 and 18. And see that question. Make a list of ways we can live our gifts as means. Means. Oh, no. Peter, take a look at any ones you like. Thank <laughs> you. 
You guys are first John three seventeen to eighteen. Let's, uh, let's take a look at those passages. So we are on the second page, top of the second page of the handout, where number five, where we've got a list there, make a list of ways we can live with our gifts as means. So we're looking at the Bible for inspiration for our list and for instruction for our list. So let's start with 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 to 13. What did you guys find there? Uh, what are some ways we can live with things as means? Well, for, for even when we know that he gave us this world, the one who is unborn in the world shall not come. It's everything, your car, your house, your life. Yeah. Waking up in the morning is a gift we use to put in the work of God. Yeah, she was saying that they, Paul and the other apostles seem to have given the Thessalonian believers in the school that whoever does not work shall not eat. Because there seemed to be kind of this problem of idleness among them. They liked, they said they weren't busy, but busy bodies, you know, just kind of going about things, not really for the sake of others, but for themselves and, and engaging in all this talk. But yeah, Kim said, no, we should see these as opportunities to, to be, we should be working for ourselves too. So not even just for others, but, but so that we earn um, with, with the work we have. Was there anything else? Sorry, did I miss anything about what you guys were saying? Awesome. So yeah, you know, work hard. God's given you the ability to to go to go and earn things from whether it be food or for other things in this life. And so He wants us to use our gifts to provide for ourselves. And then we also see it that brothers, it ends brothers and sisters never tire of doing what is good. So not only are you earning for yourself, but then you're doing good for us with it as well. So that gives us a good good place or a good thing to add to our list. How about in First Timothy five eight? What did you find there? Yeah. 
Yeah, this is the verse they read right here. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than another. Hey, friend, what I'm hearing you say is lots of really good concrete examples of using your time, using the resources for us, you know, a phone call, all these things, because we should want to provide for our relatives. That's part of being a believer. You know, believers look out for their family, especially, you know, and the family of believers at, at large, too. Anything else to add to that first? Yeah, we talked about, you know, the, the time, but then also the, the stuff. You yeah. know, everyone said, hey, they need a place to stay, and they know they're going to come to me. And, and uh, you know, when, when family has needs, we step up and, and help to meet those needs with the, with the means that God has given us. Absolutely. So, yeah, there you have it. Like Pastor said, the means. We're seeing what we have as an opportunity to serve those around us and relatives. And yeah, it, it, it kind of it makes sense. You know, this is a this is a stern warning. But if, even if our in our own household we're not living with things as means, it it is kind of a could be a sign that maybe wow, you know, that's not looking to Christ and all He did to care for the needs of others. And so, you know, part of the faith in Him is is yeah, taking care of especially those that He's put right before us in our families. Okay, so next up was Ephesians 4, verse 28. Back there. What can we add to our list? Okay, it's that anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work on something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. And we uh, hold out care with others for God. That's you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you kind of, yeah, you that includes your talent and you know your abilities that are gifts to God to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are some engaging in the complete opposite of that, right? There was this stealing, it seems, going on. And this is in a section of Ephesians where Paul's already laid out in the beautiful gospel. I mean, we have some of our favorite verses from Ephesians, like chapter two, that is by grace you have been saved, and all these things. And now he's Saying, and here's what it's like to be in, in faith, to know Christ. You know, we're gonna we're gonna care for others, we're gonna work so that we can do something useful, use our talents and time. Yeah, thank you. All right, finally, first John 3 17 to 18 in the front corner here. It's about having pity for others. There are any had a charitable part. So if you feel any kind of pity. How can we love God if you don't still have the right attitude about other people? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So how is that living with, with these things seen as means then? It, well, the main part of the um, second with me is like verse 18 here, mm -hmm. let us not love our word or speech, but with actions and in truth. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you're seeing that, you know, the actions that we have and oftentimes are connected to the things of this world that we can give to somebody or, you know, it goes beyond words and speech. It's not saying that we can't love with words. You know, words are good. And this you know, spoken, I love you, is always going to be wonderful. But we want to back that up with what we have, too. Thank you, Joe. Because here at the beginning, you see, if this is your attitude, you're living with things as an end or things as your goal because you have the material possessions right but you're seeing others in need but you have no pity and if you're not willing to you know part with some of those or use them then you've already got everything you need in, in your own mind perhaps that's what living for an end looks like you know you say well i've got everything i want and so I, i'm gonna stay comfortable i'm gonna, I'm gonna do this but no it gives us these things so we can have pity so that we can show the love of god and, um, yeah, any other thoughts or questions on that, Chris? Awesome. And I thought we could look at the, the last verse together. Oops, I guess I got to pull it down here. This is a well-known verse from the Sermon on the Mount. It wraps it all up of how we can use, use our gifts. You know, it says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And especially in this study, we're talking about, hey, Lord, we're talking about seeing how our deeds especially connected to the gifts, even the physical blessing that God has given us uh, as a chance to let the light shine on our heavenly Father. 
All right. So when we're talking about Jesus, or we're talking about serving Jesus with our things and seeing them as a means rather than something to just fall in love with and stop, right? Taking no pity on others, like the last verse. We recognize that this isn't just about things, but also about people that he's put into our lives. We don't want to see those as just an ends or all that matters to us. Should they matter to us? Yes. Yes, they should. That, well, let's not forget that. This is only Bible walking in every world, right? In every world, of course, God tells us to care for families. We just saw that in, in uh, some of the passages we read. He says, children are a blessing and a heritage from the Lord. Um, talks about mothers and being a blessing. So that's that we want to keep that in mind. But look at what Jesus says in Luke chapter 14. Um, anyone want to read this one for us? Volunteer. Thank you, Caleb. But if anyone comes to me and does not make uh, father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters, yes, in their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. So there you have it, Jesus, with what many consider to be one of his hardest words. You know, he says, You need to hate father and mother, wife, and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in their own life. How can you speak? Doesn't Jesus say, love your neighbor as yourself? You know, love, love your brother and sister? How can we make sense of what Jesus is saying? I think it's the first commandment that we love him mm -hmm. with all our heart, mind, and soul. And if we love him, it's not the but he must be first. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so you're getting to kind of this comparison thing where yeah, God's got to be number one. Yeah. And in order to to love, you have to know love and God is love, right? So then from that, all other things flow. Your ability to love appropriately to, to those mm -hmm. that are close to you. Excellent point. Yeah. And, yeah. Ultimately, God is love, and we love because He first loved us. So keep it coming first, then love in its right place flows from that. Yeah, well, let's take a look at Matthew 10, 37. This is kind of the parallel account of, of, that Jesus is talking about this, and he says it this way there. Uh, reader for that one. Thank you, Craig. All right, you ready? Go ahead. If you love your father, if you love your father, you love me, you're all going to be mine. If you love your son, you love me, you're all going to be mine. Thank you, Craig. It's good to hear these different translations, too. But, yeah. So, no, here, here he makes it more clear. Loving your father and mother more than me. So our love for God, he wants it to be so great that it's like the other loves are hate in comparison. And this is, this is a kind of what speech that we see that's kind of common in, in both Greek and in the New Testament time, that there's this strong comparison set up to really emphasize the positive thing that they're trying to teach you. Like, your love for God should be so great. This is what's most important, following me. That you know these other things should be like almost hate in comparison. But of course, we let scripture interpret scripture. And so we look at a passage like Matthew 10 and we see, oh, it's not that we shouldn't love them, but it's that we don't want to love them more than me, more than Jesus, I should say. And we see why Jesus does this. Whenever we ask him why, it's because he loves us. You know, in my uh, it was actually my, my first sermon I wrote here at Abiding Grace. It was kind of these words. I still remember saying, like, wow, this is the thing I gotta preach on. We're excited to preach to you guys. It's kind of scary. But but uh reading it more, it, it's a beautiful thing. Jesus wants you in heaven so much. He doesn't want anything to get in the way, even the things that may seem and, and are really important in our lives. But if they start to become the ends that everything we live for, mother, wife, and children, rather than him. We can see how it becomes dangerous. Because if God forbid we lose a loved one or a, or a wife or child, and, and suddenly suddenly we say, Oh God, how could you do this? And your faith is in jeopardy. Well, then this is exactly what's been happening here. You've made everything of your life matter the most, or you made mother, wife, children, father, you know, spouse, whatever it was, you made that number one. So then when you lost that, your faith was in jeopardy too. Jesus doesn't want that to happen to you. Any other questions or, or thoughts on that? I think, you know, you can have people in your life, the people you're closest to can be the most hurtful. 
And, uh, you know, I think of people who might be in other religions. You know, they may be, you know, trying to stop them from following Christ. Absolutely. Yeah. You see, you see that, right? You know, maybe a, a believer marries an unbeliever, they might jeopardize their faith a little bit. They're, they're putting that relationship before God sometimes. It's hard to not compromise. Yeah. Things like that. Yes, I don't let you put it. The gifts from God distract you from the main, you know, like these are these are his gifts. When you look at your father and your mother and people are gifts. My children are gifts from God. Mm -hmm. So then for you know, like for me, like if you get overwhelmed with being like, oh, we got something to practice, and we got, you know, you get over hyper focused on the things for your family, you can't forget to be in God's word and with God. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the more we, we consider it in your thoughts, we start to see, yeah, wow, Jesus is saying this because he loves us. He knows what's best for us is having God as our number one focus, love, and goal. That the end should be, you know, life with him. And these things are, are seen as, as gifts, like you said. We don't want to let the gift become bigger than the gracious giver. Uh, whether that be in life, someone gives us a gift. They do that because they love us. That love's way more, more important than any gift that they could have been giving you. Same with God. He gives us wonderful blessings in children and family and, and, and spouse, mothers, especially today. But we want to remember that those are gifts, like Paul was said. And that's not to say that it's not hard when they lose them. You know, Jesus, we were just looking at building on the rock on Friday at the story of Lazarus. Right? We see Jesus weep there. Because he recognizes, you know, Martha's saying, I know we'll see him again on the last day. And in fact, Jesus even knew he was about to raise Lazarus, but he saw the pain that death causes. Because we do lose a relationship that's very important to us in this life for a time. And he recognizes that that is difficult, and he felt the pain of that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. All right, so let's move on to number seven. How can gifts of family and friends be? Oh, we just we just talked about that. Let's go on to number eight. Uh, evaluate. Now we'll move on back to what went to people in our lives. Now let's go back to a little bit more specific again to money. Um, is being wealthy a blessing or a curse? We're going to use these three verses to help us, especially, but also you can use your broader knowledge of scripture if you'd like. And um, take take a uh, three, four minutes with your groups and uh, get a few blessings and a few curses on there. And we'll look for the middle. Natalie goes around. Thank you. 
It's just about time to give you 30 more seconds to finish your third thought or passage. You have any signs you said? Yeah. Oh, I'm excited. Awesome. Okay, sounds good. All right. Let's start with uh, the right side. We'll start with the curse, because I think maybe that might have been the part that was a little easier to come up with at the beginning. So what are some ways that riches can be a curse? What did you do in your groups? So it's maybe each group can maybe give a thought. Let's start with this one. We started the other side last time. What do you think? One way riches can be a curse? Uh, being eager for money uh, can mean that when you desire anything. Yeah. It can be you away from all kinds of things. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm sure some of those things will come up again. But back corner, did you have something else to add to that? Curses? The curse was uh, not the one, but the love. Yeah. Yeah, and it's good. It's good you brought that up because I think that is a very often misquoted passage. I think a lot of people say, "Oh, the money is the root of all kinds of evil," but as it says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And again, think about the, how we started class today. Back to that first John passage. It wasn't a bunch of material things he listed off, but an attitude toward them, and, and a bunch of those. So same thing with money. Love of money, root of evil. Back corner verses. Is, um, 
Yeah, absolutely. We'll get to that one. What did you say? Sorry, I couldn't hear, quite hear the first one. What was the first thing? Yeah. And I'm putting how hard it is for what Melissa said too, that remind us of what Jesus said with the eye of the needle. Okay. And then finally, front corner, anything they missed? Um, behavior that changes you. Like, it'll, 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 I have little gotten days that mm -hmm. probably get the book. Crying, you know, sure. squandering an inner sin. Yeah, yeah, might do anything for it. Sin, you know, for the money. Yeah, we see like the Bible, and even just in our own experience, we learn a lot of ways that these that riches can be a curse to us. Um, and it's good to heed those warnings. We, we must. I mean, Matthew 19, Jesus says it strongly. But the important thing to remember, too, is that the disciples understood what Jesus said, not to mean that only rich people were in danger, but how could anybody be saved, right? And then he explains that, well, through God, God, all things are possible. Um, but yeah, no, still, though, we, we want to we wanna see these warnings. How about riches being a blessing? And well, maybe we'll start back in this corner again. So uh, one blessing. Just I, how you use it when you're wealthy, you can use it for all the good God's good work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then, Corinne, sorry, what was that? One more time. What did you say, blessing last time? Yeah, it gives you a chance to put God's first. You can, you can use it, use it. May have been given a lot. You know, we see a lot of pretty wealthy people in the Bible. Abraham would have been considered incredibly wealthy for his time with the amount of flocks and, and it seems servants and herds that he had. Um, Job was very rich. And then even after everything he went through, he was made even richer, right? And so once again, we're seeing it's not so much about the things, right? Anything else? Blessing, back one. Okay. Um, like she said, there's you know, of course, providing God providing. Like for your needs, so needs Yeah, maybe you get to be a chance then to provide needs of others, and God can use you with with the wealth He's blessed you with. And then front corner, anything that anything else you want to add? Which is a blessing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got an influence. Yeah, absolutely influence the place you know use money to to make friends jesus talks about this you know using you know this is a good thing you know we want to be kind with what we have um absolutely and then one i'd add is riches they they lead us to thank god you know blessings in our lives reason to give thanks to god um of course we still give thanks to god even when we don't have them but when we do have things of course we give thanks to god so we can thanks As much as we maybe want to make Bible makes riches equal bad all the time, they certainly don't need to be that. But we're seeing a kind of a desire as the key. Like in 1 Kings 3, 3, 12 to 13, is there anything to be learned from that account for us as we have this discussion? It was King Solomon. Uh, King Solomon didn't ask for anything. Mm -hmm. and God blessed him anyway. He didn't ask for wealth or anything, and so he asked for wisdom for his people. And God needs people. So he uh, didn't ask God, and if all he did ask, I'm going to give you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, he's a wonderful example of, of having you know the right attitude toward riches. He got to you know, ask for anything, and he didn't ask for those things. But yet we see after you know he does get all those riches, some of those things led him down some some not so good paths. So we think of the many wives Solomon had, and uh, but yet we also saw how the riches God blessed Solomon with actually led to many good things as well. People would come from far off lands to hear Solomon. A lot of it was because of his wisdom too, but then also to see the grandeur of, of his temple and all these things. So so God can certainly use them. We always want to be on our guard. So you're seeing how we, how. Well, this just constantly, we just keep seeing this road, 
There are so many of these scripture, and this is no different. If we're starting to say like, oh, all money is evil, or well, we're misquoting scripture, the love of money is evil. If we're starting to say there's like money, then oh, money is great. That's how God shows that he loves us. No, absolutely not. That is not what he says either. He says that the love of money is a root of evil. We don't, we don't want to forget these things and know that ultimately, where did God show us that he loves us? Not in possessions, not in wealth, not in even in blessings of family like we talked about before, but at the cross. That is where we see how much we are worth to God and how much he loves us. But a lot of times that's really easy to say, but when the rubber meets the road, it's pretty easy to forget and think, oh God, do you, do you love me? You love this thing or this or that. That's when riches and other blessings can become a curse. Thank you. So we've talked about possessions, uh, money. We've talked about family, people in our lives. Is there anything else that you can think of that can easily become about God? This is for your chance to break some a little bit. We can do it together as a group. Anything else? Sure. Do you want to say alcohol? Sure. Absolutely. So Anything else I can become above God in our lives sometimes? Popular. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, you know what? I was just thinking about that yesterday. My most people reading had me reading in uh, I think Luke 19 or Luke 20. And there you see a whole bunch of people pleasing going on in there. There's the Pharisees who are wearing these flowing robes and all these things, and they want to keep his respect. And we also see uh, they're not willing. Jesus asked them about John's baptism. He was like, it, was it from God or not? And even though they kind of knew the right answer, they didn't want to say it because both ways would have either made people upset or would have made them accept what Jesus said. And so they just didn't even answer because they were so concerned about what the other people thought over and above truth. So we definitely see that. I think that's a big temptation for our young people today especially you know you want acceptance uh, but it's really hard to it's really easy i should say to compromise on truth for acceptance and popularity and what's the need to be elevated the need to be elevated validated. oh validated yeah that's kind of a similar one with this right validation maybe and we want that so we're a nation yeah so good Can put more above that politics. Oh yeah, absolutely. Social thing. Mm -hmm. Materialism. Yeah. How about our health? Did that ever become over and above? Yeah. Maybe not in moments of good health, and maybe a lot of us would say, "Oh, I got to be more healthy." But maybe when moments of sickness and things like that, we start to. Make that the most important. Like, God, if you were good to me, you would fix this or that. <laughs> and that's kind of becoming over and above that. Yeah. So, health. Especially when you have fitness, like that's like in the Roman and the Greek people, they work with their body, muscle, and yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's interesting to see how throughout time there's always something. Then the devil's always going to use something in our life that God intended as a gift and try to twist it into something that says, oh, this is a gift. This is giver. Look at all the, the health and happiness that this can bring you. That's what the devil's always trying to do. Turn a gift into looking like a giver. Well, let's never forget who the giver is. And this one exactly as I expected it to. I thought we were going to just fill this up. And this is just to show you that everybody can think of different things that can become above God in our lives. And it's why we thank God that in this world we're in trouble. And many times they arise from our own hearts, putting other things above God, but he's overcome this world. Um, and that's not to say that many of the things up here, um, you know, drugs, even drugs and medicines that can help us. Alcohol, it's okay to enjoy an alcoholic beverage here or there, you know, when it's done to God's glory and, and thanks to him. Politics, you know, those, those are a good thing to be concerned about and, and to want you know, to have leaders who will care for us and, and do what's best for our health and, and you know, freedoms and all that. You know, all, all of this, these are good when we don't make them the top priority of our life. We always want God to be above them. So number 10, why do you think God gives us all these things, even though he knows we're just going to mess them up? 
This one, I think you should take a minute to talk with those around you and think about it. Go ahead. One minute. Why does God give it to us when he knows we'll just mess it up? Okay. I want to get ready for that. Yeah, it's it's All right, let's uh, let's bring it back. I trust you guys got to have a good conversation about that. Uh, we're running out of time. This is literally our last final study hour because next week. Confirmation examination, and we're going to start a little 19 minute in service files later. So, I want to make sure we finish this today. So, I'll just tell you, I'll trust that you guys had a fruitful discussion about that, about God and His grace doing this. One story to help illustrate this in, in Mark chapter one, uh, Jesus healed a leper and he said to him, Now, don't tell anybody you know about this because it wasn't God's time yet. It wasn't God's time to, to reveal him to Jesus and who he was, you know, his timing. But yet Jesus healed him anyways, even though he knew he was just going to go and disregard what Jesus said. He knew that he was going to go and tell everyone, and Jesus literally told him not to. But Jesus, knowing all things, still healed him. And what a great example of us. You know, he knows what we're going to do with these. He knows that they can become number one in our lives at times. But yet he gives them anyways. A one good quote about this is one. Oh yeah, I think this is from Professor Deutschlander who, who wrote the book that this is, this is based on. He said, had he not given us things to enjoy in this world, our only temptation would have been to a sullen, sullen grumpiness, an ever complaining spirit. But he didn't want that for us. You know, God in his grace already saved us, but he gives us so many other blessings too in order to, for us to, to give him praise and joy, find joy. All right, we should take a quick visit to the other side. Um, sometimes we're tempted to an ungrateful content. I think we're meeting at 1010, by the way, for singing, yeah. Pastor told me. So, yeah. 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 Um, so we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll go for just a quick couple minutes. So the ditch of ungrateful contempt. Let's, uh, let's read these ones together. Take a look at this. Isaiah 5. Is there someone who'd be willing to read that for us? Go ahead, Graham. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. So here you see, right, the calling evil good and good evil. Um, God has never said, in our whole first part of this study, he never said that the things we talked about were evil. But it's so tempting to say, oh, it, it was those things fault. Really, it's kind of deflecting the blame. You know, we, we were the ones who misused the gifts God gave, and we were the ones who tempted to do it. So we said, oh, well, what was those things you gave us, God? Really, it was the thing, that's really been the excuse from the beginning, right? Oh, my God, it was that woman you gave why from the tree? Oh, my God, it was the serpent. Always deflecting blame to something else. And so, woe to those who say, you know what? It's because the stuff was evil. It's because money. Money is evil, God. Or, you know, oh, you know, you, you're the one who gave this wife to distract me or, or the spouse. You know, whatever it is. But God, God says, woe to those who do that. Um, let's take a look at 1 Timothy 4. I think this one I've got to pull up on here. I'll take this one. It's, it's a little longer. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. 
They forbid people to marry in order for them to abstain from certain foods. God made it to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. I just think that's such a key passage for us today in this study, right? Like, it's wrong to say that these things are wrong, and some try to make themselves seem more righteous from it. This is a big problem for the Pharisees, right? They made all these extra rules. Don't see, or don't touch, don't eat, all these things. But God said, no, you know, these things are meant that you can receive them with thanksgiving. There's the key. We don't need to hate the things of this world, but this is the attitude. God created them to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. That's interesting too, right? You know the truth, that it's from God, not from us or, or not the goal of our life, but it's a gracious gift from him. Sorry, we're running a little fast here. I'll take a look at the key quote on your page. This is, a, this is kind of the thing we're watching out for, right? It is, after all, just as easy to be proud of what one has given up as it is to be proud about what one has and enjoys, right? Some people might might want to say, like, oh, you know what, I don't, I don't mess around with, with drugs or alcohol. I don't do this, you know, and start to think maybe I'm, I'm more holy than other ones because they, they still do that. Well, God never said that. that thing is wrong, but it's the attitude making it number one. Um, you know, you can think about that with riches and other things. You know, no, I, I make sure to give this much to the poor because they know it's not good to be rich. And then look down on others and think that that's what makes you good before God, right? So any questions on that? Would you agree that that's an attitude we got to watch out for? Yeah, Sean, go ahead. Well, I see in a lot of this is a, is a perfect thing, and I think alcohol is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. You can consume it, mm -hmm. or you can consume it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's where you see a lot of this type of stuff. You can do the same thing with food. You know, any of this stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Yep, it's all about making sure, like we said, turning a gift into a giver or a consume, thing to be consumed with thanksgiving into the consumer. Yeah, thank you, Sean. So uh, I'll let you guys take a look at, at uh, the, those three psalms at home, if you'd like. Um, let's take a look at number 13, though. We're going to look at Luke 16 together. Sorry to sprint through this, but just know this is our last chance. I want to leave you with the last thing. So let's look at six, Luke 16. This is what I was quoting earlier from Jesus. This is him speaking to us. He said, I tell you the truth, or I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Here's kind of what you were saying, Sean, right? Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We can see how this applies to our other gifts, too. The Pharisees, who loved the money, heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. Not the thing, but if we are desiring it so highly. Um, so it's okay. It's okay to see these things as an opportunity, a means and to not hate them, but we want to serve God with them, make friends. And that's, what, that's a good thing. So now let's find the narrow road. This is our last little section here. We're going to look to Psalm 73. This is a little bit of a longer psalm. So if you can do it in your books, that would be awesome if you have your Bibles. And this will be a great way to wrap up this study. Psalm 73. Psalm 73, yep. All right. You know what? We're just, we're just running out. So I'll just tell you about this song. Please look at more, more of it at home. 
But uh, in this song, we see frustration from Asa at the beginning of it. He's saying, you know, I see all this prosperity for the people who are wicked. You know, they have these, they have, I don't maybe just can scroll through and show you some highlights. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. He's like, it doesn't make sense. You know, they're the ones who have been rejecting you, God, and all this. And so now they're prideful. Pride is their necklace. You know, all these things. And, and they, they say that they can lay claim to heaven. You know, they, 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 because of everything they possess, the possession of this earth. And he's saying, you know, what, what? Surely in vain, I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. All they want, I've been afflicted. And every morning brings new punishments. So you look at those two boxes here, and we see there, there are two ditches that we could fall into here. One is that is kind of where Asaph walks a little closely to here. He says, what the ditch of idolatrous love for the world says, when we see others get good stuff, we say, well, why, why should they get prosperity and not me? Well, we're making God's goodness about the things he gives rather than his love to us in Christ. Or um, the ditch of ungrateful contempt for the world says, look, God. All the things you gave them made them prideful and all that. That's why I'm going to avoid all of that. I'm not going to be like them. Look how much this messed up these people. You know, they're, they're, they're laying claim to heaven. They scoff. They speak with malice. Wow, the things did that to them. But then as the psalm goes along, he, he sees that God will make it right, of course. Um, and he realizes, you know, when my heart was greed and my spirit embittered, I was a senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. You know, he's realizing it's not about these things. Um, what really matters is that I'm always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you take me into glory. These are the things that really matter. And so he's finding his joy in those. And he recognizes that if his heart and flesh may fail, God is the strength. God is the strength beyond those things. So pray that maybe you'd like to look at that a little more as we go, but just going to the back page and I'll let you do this after we turn on the Wells connection for you. First Timothy one, six, six through eight reveals our one word description for this narrow road between loving the world and hating it. Can anyone think of what that one word would be? Maybe you're already at first Timothy, but it starts with a C. The verse goes, God, now godliness with Play is a great name. Caleb got it. Contentment. Contentment. Is that what you said? Okay. Yes. Yes. Contentment. Oh, contempt. <laughs> well, that, so not, no, not content. So that contentment is like hatred. So we're watching out for that. But content. Yeah, contentment. 